Hi, my name is Adam Carlson. I'm a healthcare analyst here at ABG, and it's my pleasure to introduce the next company and the next presenter, um, which is uh, Carlos de Sosa, CEO of Ultimavax. Uh, Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adam, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the CEO of Ultimovax, a biotech uh, company uh, located in Oslo. We have um, uh, 26 employees. If we can move to the next slide. Uh, as we are a public listed company, I need to show you the slide, but we can move to the next one. So as, as a company, uh, we operate in the treatment of cancer with uh, what we call a next generation universal cancer vaccine. Our uh, vaccine boosts the anti-tumor response. What does this mean? This means that we help the immune system to identify uh, and kill cancer cells. And we do this by recognizing a, a special target in the cancer cells uh, called telomerase and 85 to 90% of cancers in all stages of disease express this, uh, this telomerase. And we are a truly off the shelf vaccine ready to be administered, easy to use. We already have uh, uh, clinical trials that are running for more than five years that show uh, very good long-term safety and also recently strong efficacy in phase one data. And uh, some of this data was extremely important to receive from the FDA, the regulatory authorities in the US, the grant of fast track and orphan designation in the our lead indication melanoma or skin cancer. As a company, we have a, a very ambitious and broad phase two program that when concluded, we'll be enrolling more than 650 patients. And we have five studies, five phase two studies, all uh, in combinations in melanoma skin cancer, mesothelioma form of uh, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, head and neck cancer, and lung cancer. And very importantly, the first trials from these five will start reporting data in the first half of 2023. If we can move to the next slide, just to give you very briefly um, the financial situation of the company. As I mentioned, we had a successful IPO and we are listed in the Euronext Oslo since May to, uh, 2019. Um, October last year, we had a, a very successful oversubscribed private placement where we raised 270 million Norwegian krona. And at the end of um, Q4 2021, we have uh, 574 million uh, krona in cash that very importantly give us an estimated financial runway to the first half of 2024. So very important uh, during these turbulent times. And, and also even more important, as you will see, because it takes us across um, data points that are uh, potentially transformational for the company. You see there on the right, our major uh, owners are very well known and recognized um, you know, in Norway and in the Nordics. We also have international investors. And of course, these investors have a long-term perspective, very stable and very supportive of the company. So if we move to the next slide, um, the treatment of cancer was significantly changed uh, you know, in uh, about uh, uh, eight, 10 years ago uh, with the introduction of new class of drugs called the checkpoint inhibitors that really replaced a lot of the chemotherapy or a lot of these treatments that are very um, you know, harsh uh, and a lot of side effects in cancer patients. And th this was reflected that uh, just this class of drugs are expected to reach uh, close to more than $40 billion in 2022 and uh, close to 70 billion in four years time. You see there on the right, the top selling uh, drugs. And the important part, as you will see, is that our clinical studies that I mentioned to you are in combination with four out of these top five uh, drugs. And we are gonna be used in combination with them. We are not gonna be competing with them. So even um, a modest share of this market is gonna be very big. So in the next slide, you know, we, we will talk about, um, uh, next slide, please. Um, you see there the checkpoint inhibitors, this new class of drugs, their role is to open up the tumor to the immune system. That's their main job. So they need an active immune system to then be able to penetrate the tumor and kill the cancer cells. 
what unfortunately doesn't happen for a majority of cancer patients. So what our vaccine does is activate, educate, and expands the number of immune cells that the patient will normally have that then can penetrate the tumor and kill the cancer cells. So in the next slide, you will see that in addition to this, what are the key benefits? You know, you probably hear us talk about a lot of vaccines, other cancer treatments. So the first thing that is very important is that it's our vaccine is very easy to administer, just intradermal injections. So no need for co complex hospital infrastructure. The other one very important too is that it's what we call off the shelf. So it means that it's ready to be administered when needed and can be used in the general population. You don't need to do any pre-screening. Also very important is, you know, that is easy to manufacture as a long shelf life means, you know, it's just, you keep it in the normal refrigerator and there's a low unit cost. And very importantly, as I mentioned, basically directs the immune system to these cells expressing telomerase that is 85 to 90% of the cancer cells express it. And basically, you know, our vaccine will have an effect both in the primary tumor, the metastasis, it doesn't matter. So in the next slide, you can see our uh, current pipeline, you know, so a lot of the studies, uh, three studies that already completed already more than five years ago, we don't show it here, but I'm gonna uh, give you just a little bit of details of these studies, but what you see here is part of our strategy to be using our vaccine in different cancer types, uh, in different combinations. So really we show the universal potential to be used across the border in multiple uh, cancer types and in combination with different drugs. This is reflected by the high interest that we receive from uh, 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 cancer doctors uh, to really, um, you know, all over the world to really use our vaccine. In addition to these collaborations in two of these studies, uh, we also uh, participate with Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca in two of these studies. So we also have interest from big uh, pharma companies. So it's uh, um, very pleasing to really receive this interest and support. In addition to our lead vaccine, UV1, we also have a second platform with a lot of potential that is now in the first phase one in prostate cancer. So if we can move to the next slide, just to show that, you know, these were some of the initial studies, I'm not gonna go into detail, but just to highlight the fact that because of the safety of our vaccine and some of the initial data in terms of efficacy, the state has supported really the grant from the FDA to this fast track designation that is very important for a company like us because allow us to have more close interaction with the authorities, um, you know, really more support in terms of development plan, a lot of benefits as, as it is to get the um, uh, orphan drug designation. This, the results were presented at ASCO last year. ASCO is the biggest cancer conference in the world and was very well received. And just briefly in the next slide, you can see um, why this data is so exciting. Next slide, please. And the uh, uh, next, next one. Where you see here that, um, you know, in 57% of the patients, they had a reduction or disappearance of the cancer. And, uh, you know, when we used in combination and in, um, in uh, uh, pembrolizumab alone, that is one of these uh, drugs, only 33 to 37% had a response. But it's more impressive that 30% of the patients in our study had a total disappearance of the cancer, while this happened in five to 12% and the patients when they were treated with the same drug, but without our vaccine. And this is also shown in the next slide, please, where you see where, uh, the previous one, please. Uh, okay, so, sorry, there's, so I see there is a problem here. So anyway, so next slide. Um, this data was uh, uh, very supportive and uh, really, this is the first uh, slide that we have in terms of um, the first phase two studies. So this is a big, a big study, 154 patients. We are already quite advanced. In um, in last uh, last month, we have 120 patients 
already enrolled is happening in the US and in Europe. And this is the, the study where we expect to get data in the first half of 2023, so not that far away. So if we move to the next slide, we have then the other uh, phase two studies, uh, NIP was in uh, mesothelioma. This is uh, Oslo Cancer Hospital, University Hospital is the, the sponsor, and we participate together with Bristol Myers Squibb. It's happening in uh, Scandinavia, Spain, and Australia. Uh, we had 66 patients enrolled, and we also expect the results um, in the first half of 2023. The next study is a DUVAC study is in ovarian cancer. This has just started recently, December last year. Uh, very important because this is also in collaboration with AstraZeneca and a very important indication is one of the major uh, types of cancer in women. And we expect to get results um, during 2023, uh, but we will provide an updated guidance uh, next year. In the next slide, you see that another study that is running is in head and neck cancer, very, very um, um, serious type of cancer, is running in Germany, and we expect also to get data, um, you know, next uh, next year towards the end. And uh, we are very happy that we just uh, uh, ready to initiate a study in lung cancer. This uh, study is is going to be run all in Norway uh, with about uh, ten hospitals. And that's the uh, the biggest indication in cancer. So all these studies are very important. You see here our strategy of really uh, maximizing the use of our vaccine in multiple uh, cancer types. Uh, in the next slide, uh, you see that the TED platform, as I mentioned to you, is um, is a second platform where we can derive a lot of uh, products, uh, a lot of potential. But the first one that we are running is in prostate cancer at Oslo University Hospital, and we are now in the in the final phase of the study, and so far has been showing very good safety, and the data from the study will help us really develop uh, further this, this project. So if we move to the next slide, you can see uh, that we have had a very successful 2021, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, results, uh, a lot of studies, uh, the designations, but we are also a very exciting uh, next 12 to 18, uh, 18 months. Uh, so this year we um, are going to have additional data from that study I mentioned the, to you that we presented uh, at ASCO in skin cancer um, with additional uh, uh, follow-up for overall survival. We are going to uh, have the first patient in the lung cancer study and we expect also towards the end of the year to have the final safety data in the prostate cancer study. Next year is very, going to be very important for the company because, as I mentioned, in the first half of 2023, we will have the first results from two of these phase two studies. The initial study in melanoma skin cancer and the NIPU study in mesothelioma, uh, a type of um, lung cancer caused by asbestos. So uh, these studies, if they are positive, will be transformational to the company uh, from different perspectives, you know, will allow us to advance uh, partnering discussions with potential uh, partners in town and big pharma, uh, discuss with the authorities for potential accelerated approval. And also uh, during the rest of 2023 and 2024, we expect to get data from the other phase two studies and again, because these are uh, started recently, we expect to get um, um, to get the um, you know an updated guidance uh, in one year time with the Q4 report of 2022. So it's going to be a very excited period uh, for the company. So if we move to the next slide and just to to summarize, uh, as a biotech company, we are very well positioned in the in the space of um, of vaccines for uh, treating cancer. Uh, with um, a platform both with the lead product UV1 and the and the TAT technology, really um, enhancing the impact and the duration of the effect of the immune oncology therapies that is broadly applicable in different uh, cancer types in different therapeutic combinations. As I show you, um, has a very strong commercial potential if we show this data because we can be used in multiple combinations in multiple types of cancers. Very important, we off the shelf, easy to use. 
In the treating cancer patients, as you know, you know they are sick. They also have side effects from uh, other cancer therapies. So it's very important if we, we continue to show that we have a good safety profile because more and more, as you know, cancer patients are treated with combinations of multiple drugs. It is important, as we've shown so far, that we have a good safety profile. Um, the fact that we have all these um, uh, phase two studies running really highlight the potential that we have for the company and um, you know a very ambitious program, uh, the result of a very dedicated team you know, with more than 650 patients, more than 100 hospitals in approximately 15 countries. Um, the fact that we received the fast track designation and orphan drug designation from the FDA provides a, 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 a sort of a regulatory validation. When this was also recognized by the uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca, the valve that they accept to uh, participate in these studies, in these studies in collaboration with us. And of course, also the fact that we are moving along with the first product from our TED platform, and that has a lot of potential. We have a, a very experienced team, a strong shareholder base really allowing us to, to focus on the business and the good cash position that is a very enviable position to be in these turbulent times, but really uh, taking us a runway towards the first part of 2024 takes us uh, over these very important milestones that we are going to have next year, uh, in, the, in the next 12 to 24 months. So with us, you know, I hope that I gave you a, a a little uh, perspective of um, what we do and the value of investing in our company uh, for treating cancer patients. And I'm happy now to uh, answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for that presentation. Um, we have time for a few questions. Um, so a first one, one that we get uh, quite often is, <laughs> is uh, on kind of the, the degree of read across between these different studies. You, you mentioned you have five uh, phase two studies um, uh, ongoing or soon to be ongoing. Um, and I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on how much you know success or, or failure in one study kind of reads across to the other programs. And in particular, I guess, if there are certain programs that you feel are uh, kind of more reasonable to read across between uh, and what the reasons would be for that. I, I don't think we, you know, of course, um, you know, one of the benefits of this uh, uh, very big uh, phase two program is also to manage the risk uh, to the company, to the program. If we'll have only one indication and the indication will be not positive, basically will be, will be the end uh, 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 of the company, in a way we are uh, diversifying that risk. So we cannot say that uh, you know all these cancer types are very different. And they are treated with different classes of drugs. Uh, some of them are extremely hard to treat, like uh, head and neck. Um, so what we can say, you know, if we fail in one indication, doesn't mean that we are going to fail in other indications. But if we start seeing positive data, that at least proves the concept that uh, targeting telomerase is a valid concept. So I think it's more that if we start getting positive data, um, you know, we prove the concept, uh, but we cannot guarantee that we are going to have five study positives. We, we, we hope, we wish, um, but all these uh, cancer types are different. So I think it's more on the positive side that if we, if we show in one study that we prove the concept of telomerase, then, you know, we have a little bit more probability that we can show in, in at least some of the other indications, but it's not a guarantee. Sure, got you. Um, and, and a question um, uh, that it would be interesting to get your thoughts on, um, this, this high profile ODAC um, meeting that the FDA held a few weeks back where they uh, sort of decided on a new policy around how they would look at uh, Chinese um, alternatives to checkpoint inhibitors or oncology drugs in general, but in particular checkpoint inhibitors, um, essentially making it more difficult for those to be approved in the US just based on studies conducted in China, uh, which has been interpreted as, as likely delaying the launch of those kind of checkpoint inhibitor alternatives in the US market anyway by, 
by some years, um, which was obviously a, a positive event for, for those companies, <laughs> Astra, BMS, etc. Um, you guys are obviously not on the market yet, but you do have studies in combination with these drugs. How do you view it, and does it have any kind of impact on Ultimavax? Was it a, was it a positive development from your perspective, or, um, or sort of neutral, un, unimportant? How do you see it? I would say that you know, of course, is 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 good to see that at least you know um, the standard of care is not going to be changing um, quickly. I think here, you know, uh, for us is primarily neutral. What we want to show is that we can be used with checkpoint inhibitors, you know, and we are a little bit agnostic. We don't really care which one. That's why we try to combine with different ones. I think this is going to be, you know, not particularly because is um, is uh, China, you know, it's more really a problem there. Uh, but I think that uh, the the um, the whole space, we are going to have uh, the other checkpoint inhibitors. You know, we have now the Sanofi one uh, that are going to be launched at, um, uh, you know, potentially lower price. So for us, uh, you know, the more checkpoint inhibitors there are, and the more they are used. Uh, the more, if we show positive data, the more we will be used. So for us, what is important is that the the increase in the usage of checkpoint inhibitors, and of course, in some markets, uh, cost is, is an important factor, you know, that when we are living in the, the more developed countries. Uh, but for us, what we see as a positive development is when checkpoint inhibitors start moving earlier in the treatment paradigm. And um, and this is where we hope that basically we can uh, tag along the checkpoint inhibitors. The more they are used in different cancer types, you know, increases the usage of UV1. And when these treatments start to go earlier in the stage of the disease, that we can go with them. So we see all developments uh, in the checkpoint inhibitors in terms of uh, broadening of usage, uh, uh, more patients being treated as a positive for us. Uh, the China is 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 a neutral. I think that um, you know uh, China is a very important market. You know we we are talking with different companies there. We see it as a huge potential. But I I think um, uh, was a little bit of setback for um uh, for those companies. Uh, uh, but I'm I'm I cannot say that I'm totally surprised. You know. Sure, sure, great. And and one question. Um, inevitable given uh, given the, the turbulent times and, and the geopolitical uh, situation in Europe, um, which has affected some biotech companies with, with trials ongoing in, in Russia and, and Ukraine um, and, the, and the, that territory. Um, do you have clinical sites in, in, in those countries? Uh, has it, has it, will it impact um, recruitment in, in your ongoing studies? Um, no, you know, of course, you know, we, we, we really feel for the for the Ukrainian people, and um, you know, so we're really sorry for the, all the situation that has an impact in a lot of companies, but particularly on the people itself. But uh, for us, really doesn't affect. We don't have any any centers, uh, both in Russia or Ukraine, and uh, also our product is manufactured in uh, uh, Germany, France, and finished in Italy. So even from a product supply, anyway, we have we have inventory. Uh, the, in terms of our activities, it uh, doesn't uh, affect us. But of course, as a company, as individuals, we feel for all the situation. Gotcha. Um, and maybe just one last question before we have to finish. Sure. Um, the, um, uh, in terms of sort of milestones or so, before the phase two study start reading out H123, we've got the, uh, the TENDU uh, safety data but also the long-term follow-up from the phase one melanoma studies. Um, can, you, can you give any, um, uh, any, any kind of color on, on when in, in time those follow-up data would come? Is it likely to be at a scientific meeting? You present the stuff at ASCO uh, last year, um, or will it be outside of a scientific meeting setting, do you think? Uh, well, we, we are gonna have the, the follow-up data on the second cohort, the two-year follow-up you know, in um, in um, in the third quarter, and uh, the three-year follow-up of the first cohort in the same study in, in the fourth quarter. And uh, so the idea is, of course, to communicate, you know, the top-line, uh, you know, information on the overall survival. That's what we are um, following. Uh, but what we are going to do um, is, um, 
put all this data together to then be presented at a conference. As you, you know, and naturally, if the data is going to be available third and fourth quarter, it's not going to be ASCO and this year. But you know, there are other uh, conferences that are very, uh, very specific for the specialty. You know, melanoma and melan uh, uh, oncologists in specializing melanoma. But we are also planning for a publication of a, a complete set of data. So we definitely want to maximize the value of this very important data. And we, the investigators are very excited to, to both uh, be part of the publication and to present this data at the international conference. So that's the plan. Great. Carlos, we're at time. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation and, and the Q&A. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.